So uh, let's uh, let's get going. So uh, yeah, I'm giving a talk on uh, persisting uh, data and functional programs. So uh, as we were seeing in the keynote this morning, obviously one of the things that comes up when people first come into the sort of functional programming ideas is what do you actually do in terms of storing your data if you're in this pure environment where there's no side effects and obviously there are really because you know Haskell programs have output and how does that all work? Um, so this is not really a theory talk. This is uh, much more of a sort of practical thing. So this is an actual program. It's not uh, sort of fully pure. I work with F Sharp mostly in sort of .NET side of things, but most of the things that we're doing here will, will apply across functional programming languages. And uh, yeah, let's, let's have a look. So, wrong button. So uh, I needed a, a domain for us to talk about, so hopefully you'll be able to see these. But that's, that's me at the moment. But um, uh, I thought I'd have a nice simple domain, so we have a domain of a card game. So if I hold this up, can you all see that? You get to see a mirror image of the card, apparently. I'm not quite sure why that is. But anyway, so, so this is a card game um, that was uh, created by myself and my son. It's very simple, because my son is seven. Um, and what it involves is a fight between multiple martial artists, as seven-year-old boys uh, like, to, uh, like to do. So you can do various things. You have cards for uh, trying to throw people. You can defend against other attacks. So if someone you know, plays a throw to try and throw you, you can play a defend, which is faster, so it has a lower number, and you defend against it. And you can do punches. And then, of course, because you're seven and things have to be exciting, you also have special attacks that allow you to break the normal rules and play multiple cards at once. You probably have no idea what that says, given it's written backwards and uh, moving around on the screen. But that's fine. You don't need to have a deep understanding of this domain, but it should give you an idea of roughly what's going on. So I'm just going to run through the basic rules uh, very quickly so that uh, you've got an idea of what we're talking about. So each player has their own deck of cards. We've got 20 yards in the deck, which represents a martial art. So the game starts off to determine who goes first. You each draw four cards. You can play one of them face down, and the person who plays the lowest card goes first. And then you move into the main game, where the players take it in alternating turns to play cards to try and affect each other. And uh, you can also counter. So there, there is a set of rules where if someone plays a particular type of attack, you can either defend or you can counterattack, And that keeps on bouncing back and forth during that turn until someone fails to either defend or counter, and then that turn is, is over. So I'm using this because it, it gave me a nice balance between something that is complex enough to feel like a real problem, um, but also simple enough that uh, it wasn't an enormous amount of code to, to knock together. And I want to have a look at how we could sort of model this type of problem domain in a functional style, how we can then sort of make sure that we've got a persistent data store so that uh, we, can, we can call things back. And then what I've done is I've written a very simple sort of HTTP uh, API over the top of the game so that you can then play it. And uh, there was going to be a website, but at the moment you play it via Fiddler because uh, JavaScript is not my strong point. But there we go. There you go. Let's, let's have a look. Um, the code, as it currently stands, is up in a GitHub repository, but obviously I'm going to uh, be showing you what it looks like locally. So as is that big enough for people to read? Let's, uh, let's make a bit more room. So probably like most people working in strongly typed functional languages, what I like to do when I first sort of start investigating a domain is try and build some types that constrain the, the, the values that I'm going to be using to things that are actually sort of valid. So I was having a quick look at this, and so Obviously, we've got this core concept, this core data type of a card. It's a card game, so that's not too surprising. 
Um, so a card can have uh, a suit, and there are some types of special cards as well. So a basic card just has a suit and a value. Special cards have some other properties. And I was thinking it would be nice to be able to identify a game. So we've got a game ID. That's just a, a thin wrapper around a GUID at the moment. And also, we've got this distinction between names of players and decks. And then a, a player, when we start a game, is defined by the name, the identifier of that player within the game, and the name of the deck. So that's, that's sort of the core data types. And then we were thinking, you know, during the, um, the keynote speech, we were talking about sort of ways of reducing sort of composing functions and, and passing things through. And I think, so how do I want to model the, the state of the card game? And obviously, in an imperative language, what you'd normally do is you'd build a, a big data structure, and then you would have a series of, of uh, methods on that data structure that could then manipulate it. They could change it. They could sort of you know add a card, take a card away, make sure a card is played, those kind of things. Whereas something that we've started using recently and, and which uh, we found very powerful as a technique is instead modeling how things change by the events that happen to them and then keeping track of those events. So I was thinking, okay, so it's a card game. What events can happen in the card game? So, um, so maybe, you know, the game can be created. Someone, you know, sends in a request to the web service saying, I want a new game, these are the people playing, and this is the ID it was created with. And because I like pure functions, I'm also carrying around a seed for the random number generator for doing things like shuffling the deck. So the games are actually deterministic. If you start with the same game created event, you'll always get the same output because that, that random seed is carried through. Okay, so what else can happen? Well, cards can be moved around, so they can be picked up from a deck and come into your hand. They can be discarded. Uh, players can take damage. Um, players can try and issue commands. So there's a difference here between a command and a, an a event. So a command might be something like, I want to play an attack. But obviously, if they play a card that isn't valid, so you know they play a defend card when it's their turn to attack, that isn't a valid move. So the command is still given. You might want to audit it, you might want to record it, but it, it doesn't create an event in the game because nothing will actually happen. All that will happen is you'll send an error message back saying, you can't do that at the moment. So we had a few other events, so you can choose someone to target, and then a few that sort of just keep, help you keep track of the state of the game. So a turn is com comprised of multiple phases, so a phase can be completed, um, and obviously a new turn can start, so that can keep people sort of notified of what's happening. And then I created this, just this wrapper type, which is a discriminated union, so this is just a type that can contain multiple other types with names, just so that we've got a general overview, overall type of a game event. You know, an event has happened in the game. And um, sort of putting these together, these, these, these worked out quite nicely. So these, these are all the ways that the game can change. Obviously, there's still no encoding of the rules here. Um, so this is all purely about how we kind of keep track of what has happened, but there's no logic here. There's nothing about how things happen or what's allowed to happen or how we sort of issue commands or anything like that. So this is, this is just kind of encoding the domain and making sure that I can keep track of everything legal that, that could, could occur. So before we go any further, because we're going to be using quite a few of them, have people come across discriminated unions before? Is this sort of a new concept or everyone's kind of seen them at least a bit? It's going to get confusing if you haven't. Yep. Every, everyone seems happy with that. E excellent. Okay, so, so let's carry on. So, so now, I, now I can sort of, I can keep track of what's happening. So I was thinking, okay, so uh, 
that that's great and all, but obviously now I need to be able to send commands in. So I had to think about it. And okay, so what what commands can we actually? What can what can a player ask to do? And the list is actually quite short. It's quite a simple game. So again, we can we can request for a game to be created. We can play one of our face down initiative cards at the beginning when it's time to determine the turn order. We can play an attack, we can play a counter, or there's this move to stance thing. This is an idea where you can, you can build up face up cards in front of you. Um, so you, know, you give a clue to your opponent what you're doing, but on the other hand, you, uh, you get more options. So there's these five commands. Now, this is where normally things would sort of start to diverge in the imperative and, and, and the functional world, because obviously these would, in an object-oriented piece of code, they would directly map to the methods on your sort of game state object. You know, you would call the start game, that would probably be the constructor, you know, you'd, you'd new up your game state, and then you would call these methods to mutate the game state, and you'd keep on moving forwards. And generally, you'd kind of persist that probably into something like SQL Server or into a document store, and you would have a snapshot of your state at that point. So you, you'd, call the, you'd call the operation, you'd mutate your state, and then you'd save that snapshot somewhere. But again, going back to the keynote, we know that there's a whole load of issues around that in terms of things like Concurrency, for example, you know, I'm putting a web server in front of this, so there's obviously going to be multiple requests coming in at the same time. And more seriously, in, in, in our real business domain, we, we deal with communications between companies and their customers. Um, we have a lot of requirements around audit logs and being able to prove that we have tried to communicate with people. So we want not only to have a snapshot of the current state, but we also want to be able to sort of replay how we got there. And so this is why we got into this thing of modeling changes as a series of events. So what we need is kind of we need a, a state machine. We, we need a, a, an, an input state. We need a function that takes one of these commands and, and spits out the events that that command would cause. And then we need another function that can take that input state and apply those events one by one until you end up with a, a new state as a new object, and then we can, we can persist that. So I'm not actually going to go through the implementation of those functions. You can download the code later and have a look, but most of it is around sort of lots of list juggling because each you know, selection of cards is a list, so it's lots of taking cards out of lists and into lists and all that kind of stuff. But let's actually um, let's have a look at what that looks like to use. So that's the wrong file. That's not going to help. So this script, I'm not sure I've got enough room to show both at the same time. Let's see if we can get this going. So this is um, uh, an F-sharp script file rather than a compiled file. So I'm, I'm literally just loading up all of, the, um, all of the source code. And as you can see in this script file, we're going to create a couple of players with a couple of decks of cards. Um, and then also, we've got this um, idea of fold functions, which we'll get to in a moment. So let's start evaluating some of these things. So we'll load everything up in an interactive environment. So now we've got some players. In our main library, we've got this idea of this um, process events method. So again, if we go back to our keynote and the idea of our um, embellished functions, this is, um, this is how this, this code's been written. So we have this um, process events method that takes a game state takes an event and it returns a result that can either be a game state or an error and then this bind 
function here, that's the equivalent of the compose from this morning in the keynote, just so that we can keep on taking in results that could be valid or could be an error. And if we ever get an error state, we just, we just short circuit the evaluation and we drop through and we return the error. So that's a function that knows how to take a game state and apply an event to it. And then we can use that to build a function that takes a game state and a command. And what it does is it processes the command to get a list of events. You probably can't see the tooltips very clearly, but that events there is a list. And then it does a fold of those events using the method above. So have people here come across the idea of a, a fold fold across a list to reduce it down? Is that concept that people come across? Wave if you haven't heard of it, because we can, we can do some demos. Uh, let's, let's just do a quick, very quick example. So, I mean, the simplest version of these is that um, if we have a list of numbers, There's a couple of things you can do. So one that you've probably come across before is you can reduce the numbers. So, so that just adds up all of the numbers in the list. Unfortunately, there's a problem with uh, reduce, which is it's actually a partial function. If you feed it an empty list, it fails because it needs to have um, because it's trying to apply the, the, the function and get a result out of the type that the function returns. So if there's no values, it fails. So fold is just a, an extension on uh, reduce in, in many ways, in that what it does is it takes your, I've got to remember which way around the signature is now, function first and then state. So it takes an initial zero value that you're happy to say, if there, if there isn't anything in the list, what's kind of the nothing? The, so for addition, it's normally zero. For multiplication, you'd normally use one. Um, for some things, it just there isn't anything valid to put in there. So at that point, you know that you have to separately handle the case of a, an, an empty or a, a, a list with values in. Um, so obviously, if we now list fold numbers, that will take each number in turn, each pair of numbers in turn, add them together until there's only one left. And, uh, Reduce that down. And obviously that then works on a, an empty list because it just starts with zero and returns zero. It never, never applies anything. So we have this idea that we can take these events in a game state and our game state at this point just becomes a fairly simple state machine. You know, it, it has a number of different states it can be in, and applying an event to it changes the state. So it actually starts off in the nothing state, because the first event that can occur is that a game has been created. So let's just have a quick look. So a game can be in a state of nothing. It can be during the initiative phase at the beginning, where people are playing face down. It can be in progress, or someone could have won. So there is a bit more complexity in the open game thing uh, phase. There's a sort of a, a, a mini internal state machine to that phase again. But it's not a massive amount of complexity. And so what you can happen is, is as you apply these events, you can shift between the different states and rather than something like a list fold where you know you sort of you, you, you expect that to be an always increasing um, uh, number, you, you can sort of end up going through cycles and, and returning to similar states and, and uh, moving this through. So let's uh, let's see this in action. I've already evaluated most of that, so let's not do that again. So what I've done, you might have noticed, is um, this event fold thing has a a side effect thing where I'm actually just going to print out the events as, as we go through them. 
So if we start off with just one command, so if we go there, so you can see that what happened is that we've put in one command, and that's actually generated this list of events here. So when we sent in that command, we've created a game created event, which says, okay, the game's been set up, this is its ID, here's the random seed. And then it's also said, well, actually, this player here, Bob, he's drawn four cards, wherever it is, and Fred has drawn four cards as well. So the thing which is processing the events doesn't need to have any awareness of the rules of the game. You know, the, the command processor needs to know how to take a command and generate events, but whatever it is that's listening to these events, it doesn't need to know the rules of the game. It can just rely on the fact that it was legal for Bob to draw a card at that point. And then as we shift through, let's... Uh, so if we run that again with an extra command added, you'll see that at the end there, as well as all of the cards being drawn, we've now also got a card being played at the end. Bob's played a card, and we can carry on through adding more to these. And you'll notice at this point, we're still in our start state where it's listening for initiative cards. If both of the players have played, and we run that through again, We've now transitioned to the game being in progress. And if you look up a bit, we've got a second played event. And we've now got enough information to determine whose turn it is. So we've also got a turn started event saying, oh, actually, Bob gets to go first. And now, in fact, it says that it's Bob's turn and we can carry on the game. So this is nice from a sort of functional programming point of view. This is all kind of nice known functional programming concepts. You know, you've got a discriminated union to represent the set of legal states of your domain. You've got nice strongly typed sort of operations on it. Um, you're folding down a list to reduce to the current state. This is all lovely and, and obviously these are immutable data structures. Um, and these are pure functions. So we can do all of the nice things that we were hearing about in the keynote this morning in terms of you know, con concurrency works. We've got no issues with mutability here. Um, and you know, it, it, it's all very nice. The problem is, is that the first time that I wrote a piece of code like this, we're a Microsoft shop, and the next stage in the process was, OK, so let's save this into SQL Server. And then everything suddenly started getting very, very nasty. Because you might have noticed that most of these types don't have a particularly relational data structure. And if you start just whacking all of these events into a document store, then you've suddenly got this issue that you need to keep track of sort of all of the links between your documents and what order they happen in and how they're related to each other. And that gets interesting very quickly. And whatever you do, if you're working in the .NET world, don't try and run most ORMs against F-sharp discriminated unions, because the SQL they generate is absolutely hideous. It's not nice <laughs> at all. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd recommend not, not going that route. Write, write your own data access layer if you have to use a, a relational database for some reason. So. Turns out, though, that we're not the only people who have thought about this. So, um, so that's where this guy comes from. Um, we started playing with something called Event Store. Um, the guys who write Event Store heard that I was doing this talk, so they've given me one of their mascots. So there you go. You can come and see that. There's even stickers available later. They, they felt the need to, uh, to, to send merchandising for some reason. So there we go. Um, so. Let's have a look at how that works. So, so event store is basically a way of persisting lists and then doing folds against them. Um, except, of course, that it stores them uh, persistently for you, which is, which is lovely. So what we can do is, it, in the same way that we could memoize a fold across a list in memory, 
we can start doing that for lists stored in Event Store. And the interface for Event Store is really, really simple, in effect, because what you do is you give it the ID of the list of events that you want and the number of events that you've already seen, and then it sends you the rest of them. So if you've already downloaded the first 10,000 events, done a fold, got the current state, you can send to it and say, actually, I want everything from 10,000 onwards, and it will send you another five or whatever you've got left. Um, so it gives a really nice direct mapping between our functional code and what things look like on the server side. So this script here, everything's happening in memory. There's no persistence. If you restart it, you, 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 you lose everything. Let's start having a look at a web front end. So it, it's obviously pretty because, you know, I'm... You, you'll see the, the depths and wonders of my design skills in a moment. So there's our web server started up. We should have event store started up, hopefully. So let's refresh that. There you go. So this is a game that was uh, underway. And uh, let's move that across a bit given we don't seem to have the full, full screen. So, so that's uh, Bob's view of the game, because this is the other interesting thing that we'll get into in a moment, is that obviously the view of the game that you were seeing before, you probably didn't notice, but it had all kinds of things like which cards were in the player's decks that hadn't been drawn yet. Now, obviously, that's not the kind of information that you want to show to the individual players. So, and that's the view that uh, Fred has of the game. And you can see that Fred's been beaten up a bit. And uh, there we go. So, I'm gonna stop that again for a moment because otherwise Visual Studio pops up all kind of debugging information. What does this actually look like? Well, we've got a few things going on. So obviously we've got a bit of plumbing you know, I'm setting up a, a connection to the event store, waiting for it to uh, fire up before we, we do anything else. And event store, by, by default, you can either, uh, if you want to run queries on event store, it, is, it, it prefers to have data submitted in JSON format, and it will actually use JavaScript as its um, query language, rather bizarrely, but there you go. Um, so I am actually JSON encoding data and decoding data, so there's a few helper methods to do that. But then our entire data access layer is basically handled by these two methods here. So we've got a refresh method that takes a state that we already know, the number of events we've already seen, a function to fold them, uh, to fold any new ones that come in, and the ID of the stream to get back. So that we can always just pass in the state up to the point we've already seen and say, what's happened since? Give me the rest. And as you can see, we've just got this fold in here. Our code is looking very similar to uh, the in-memory version. And our persist method, which takes a number of things, it takes the expected um, event number that we think is in the list. So if we try and persist events into a stream, we, you can either just say persist them regardless, or more frequently what you do is you say, I last saw the stream at this snapshot, I think I should be able to add these events immediately afterwards, and if anyone else has added anything to the stream in between, your write will fail. So you, you evade a whole load of concurrency issues because you never write sort of unexpected events into a stream. And so what you do is if you try and write and you, you fail because there's been other events written in since you last read, then you just go through the loop again. You do a refresh, you get those new events, you try and fold over them, which may succeed or may not. Um, and then you can try and persist your events so that's our entire data access layer, um, which, is, which is nice. 
And then, obviously, we don't want to be rereading the whole lot from Event Store the whole time. So Event Store is a write-only mechanism to streams. You can't amend events once they've been persisted. So um, that can take a bit of thinking about in terms of how you model your domain. So you know the classic example is if you're doing something like a shopping cart on a website um, in Event Store that you can't have the concept of adding an item as an event and then removing that event. You have to have a add the item event and remove the item event and you run through all of them. So it's, it's a write-only process. But that means that you can always cache the results. So here I'm doing an in-memory cache. You can actually take snapshots within Event Store itself if you're willing to write your folds in JavaScript. Um, or you can obviously cache to disk, you know, sort of whatever happens. And so we can just get things, using our refresh method, we can just get a stream. And if we've got a cached item, we refresh from where we got to before, and if we don't, we just load the entire stream from event zero onwards. Um, the interesting he thing here is that the other thing that our, our sort of caching mechanism takes is it also needs to know which fold is being applied to these events, because the game server obviously needs to know everything. It needs to know about the internal state of the decks, so it knows that when a player draws a card, which card is going to be drawn. Um, it needs to know about everybody's hands, even though a player can only see their own hand. So what we are doing here is we've got two different types of fold. So we've got the main game server fold, which will just take all of the events and generate the internal state that the server needs to work out whether commands are valid and what events occur because a command has been submitted. And we've also got this second fold, which is parameter parameterized by the player name. So that will actually give back a different result for each player, but they're all running off the same events. So here I'm being lazy and I'm actually I'm actually calling back the events for each different fold. But obviously what you can do is you can actually just get all of the events once from the server and then run it through each of the different folds to get the different views that you needed the data. Um, and you can also, again, with Event Store, you can actually do that projection server-side. So you can write JavaScript folds and say, every time a new event occurs, update this projection, and then you can just call back the... Uh, the projection. And then at that point, our API becomes very simple. We can uh, basically map directly from these endpoints to the commands that we were talking about for the in-memory version of the, ge of, the, of the game. So we have a few URLs here that we can post JSON to. And those map directly to the commands that we had in our domain. And basically these methods here just become very, very thin wrappers around our process command method. And what's interesting here is that we can now start to separate out the commands that are coming in from the views that are coming out. So obviously, this is a, a web service. It's operating asynchronously on each request. So the person who's posted the command in, they don't want to know, really, about the list of events that's come back. They just want to apply that command to the game state. And then obviously, all of the players need to be sort of notified that that state has changed. So this method here never actually updates the, the game state at all. All it does is it gets the command in, it works out what events that command would generate, and then it persists those in the event store. In the meantime, our web page is here. Can I get the thing up? No, for some reason developer tools in Chrome is not playing at the moment. But um, our web pages here are polling, or they could use web sockets or whatever, to get the new view. So if you post in a command, 
then you immediately write those commands into event store and the next time that one of those views gets read back it will get the new state and you can completely separate the the commands coming in from the queries that you're running against it so if you want to sort of look into that more it's a very useful technique um, again mostly written up by the guy who actually wrote event store as well the, the two are not sort of isomorphic, but they're, they're very useful techniques to move together, so that's called CQRS, and you can, you can read more about it. Um, and this also plays very nicely with sort of actor frameworks as well, because you can have actors that know about commands and actors that know about sort of handing you back projections. So that's kind of a, a whistle-stop store of, of what's normally referred to as technique as event sourcing. So you, you have a processing domain that, that issues bunches of events and then you have different projections over those events that you use to uh, to create your views and probably I will leave it there and take any questions if that works well can do I mean I can show you it working if you want to uh, let, let's have a, actually let's have a quick look at event store because that's the that's the other side of things that it's nice to be able to see so that's it's gone. Great. sometimes I'm not quite sure why those haven't disappeared from the but this is um, this is what event store looks like if I can get it to actually uh... ah, there we go so this is what a stream looks like an event store and if you go back through then as you can see you can uh, can have a look at the different events coming in and nicely separate that out and we can sort of post uh, stuff into the server and change the state as we want to so but I'll leave that for now. I think it's probably easiest at this point if I take questions and then we can go from there and yep. <laughs> so are there any questions? Are there any bits that people would like me to go into in a bit more depth? Anything? So, yeah, the question was, uh, what happens if you start losing your cache, um, especially if you've got l very sort of long-running streams? And um, there's a couple of things there. One is, is that normally a single entity will be represented by a single stream. So, for example, in this case, each game will be a stream in its own right. So, in general, you would try to avoid um, streams which are sort of of ever-increasing length. Um, the other side of it is that, um, yes, you would have to, at that point, reprocess from, from the beginning. Um, what can be quite nice about things like Event Store is that it's actually a clustered system, and you can set up a division between operational and um, projection uh, nodes in the cluster. So you can actually, at that point, spin up extra nodes to rebuild your cache, uh, without affecting sort of operational ongoing data. So that can be quite useful for sort of arbitrary queries as well across large data sets. Uh, yeah. uh, I was wondering if the implementation of even store is done with an SQL database. 
Um, no, uh, Event Store itself is is its own thing. Um, it um, uses a, a sort of write-only log, um, and it's it's engineered from the ground up specifically for this type of um, database. Um, there is. Uh, if you're in the .NET world, there is also a library, which annoyingly is also called Event Store, um, which consists on top of multiple persistence backends. So that, for example, will try and generate you an SQL schema for storing events, or will use a document data store. Um, I can't remember which document data stores it supports offhand. Um, we looked into it, but from an SQL point of view, we, we found it, we, we decided that it would be get a bit of a nightmare for long-term maintenance because in effect all it does is generate one enormous table that it writes binary blobs into for each event. Um, so it works, it's very, very fast when you've got a small number of events, but we didn't trust it would carry on that way. Anything else? Nope. I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>